Anthony, Salim, Mahalakshmi, and all friends who are gathered here today. I'm of course very happy to be here to be able to take part in Visha's 60th birthday celebration. How I wish that she was here. I have known Visha uh, as a teacher my first in my class in uh, 77 is when that's the batch she was in 1977 to 79 in the MA batch so I've known her since then she was in the same class as my sister so Cheta so they were and they were very good friends so I've also known Anthony since then we saw the budding romance <laughs> <laughs> it's their wedding anniversary today it's, it's oh, their wedding anniversary <laughs> And uh, so I had the opportunity to know her very closely over so many years. It started out as a student, but then Visha became a very good friend and I was extremely fond of her and I think she was also of me. So we shared a very strong uh, relationship. I admired her a great deal because I always thought that behind that quiet exterior who was a very strong person with very strong views and with very strong resolve and as you said especially when the illness took her as, as it did on many occasions that's when the mind over matter uh, principle which you talked about was very evident how she fought that and how well she conducted herself i remember when in Tinmurti she used to come and she had severe problems with her eyesight but she would come every day after taking her classes at Jesus Mary College she would come to the library and spend the rest of the day there. Well I also knew her very much as part of Bipin's student family you can call it and that was in many ways a very close-knit family because we met regularly and regularly uh, to hold discussions that was part of the way in which we functioned for years so it's not just one year I mean it would be over so many years I cannot imagine on how new how many occasions we would have had discussions which lasted well uh, into the evening or sometimes uh, even the night remember once when Bipin was drafting his uh, short monograph on communalism a primer he was so concerned that that rather than any research work which he did should be absolutely perfect that he made all of us sit for days on end and you remember we would sit in the ASC office those days that there was the director and we would spend hours because he would make sure that every line was read out and discussed uh, threadbare he would insist that Anthony also came uh, even though Anthony by then was a journalist and not directly involved with academics but so there are so many memories of Fisha. Fisha was very active during the first when the first NDA government launched its attack on uh, you know textbooks she was very active in the campaign we worked together she was very concerned about it she wrote also participated in the writing of a uh, textbook. We know from her students in JMC, they've been here very often on these lectures, what a wonderful and committed teacher uh, she was. And uh, I could go on, and but I think uh, it's enough to just be able to be all of us here today and share our memories of her and I'm sure that wherever she is, she is very happy and uh, listening to what's going on with a smile on her face as there always was and then at the end of it make one little caustic comment. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about uh, today about Indian nationalism past and present. As Sadiq mm -hmm. said, this is a subject that would certainly have had uh, Visha's approval 
uh, her own work was very squarely in the area of nationalism. Both her books, very fine books by the way, I think I'm a great admirer of her work. Her combination of absolutely sound empirical research with very uh, fine analysis is I think a kind of ideal uh, that I think uh, history researchers should uh, aspire for. I think her work is extremely, extremely uh, significant. So, as I said, the subject today is one which I think is suited to the occasion. So let me get ahead with it. I'm going to be talking first for a while in a general sense about the idea of nationalism because I think that's important for me to be able to make my later arguments about the nature of Indian nationalism past and present. So when and how and why, in what historical context did the idea of nationalism first emerge? How did nations emerge? And then, this is the question I take up, and then I will come more specifically to the issue which concerns us today, that is the nature of Indian nationalism in the past and the present. Most scholars who have studied the phenomenon agree on one thing, that nationalism is a modern phenomenon. Even though it harks back to the ancient past to buttress its claims, it is not something that was born in the past, in the remote past. You did not have the notion of nationalism or nations in the ancient past or in the medieval past. However, as nationalism emerges as an idea and when nations get formed, which first starts in Europe in the 17th and continues in the 18th and 19th centuries, in the formation of those ideas, in the formation of the nations, they look back upon their past and go back to that past to find elements of continuity, of commonality, which may help to keep them together or bring them together or help in the crystallization of the new national identity. Why am I emphasizing this? Seems like almost a textbook kind of lecture on uh, nationalism. I'm emphasizing this because very often we find in public discourse, we tend to confuse these two. We are told, for example, in India today, all the time, that we were a nation in the hoary past. In fact, every little while that uh, how past it was, how old it was, is pushed back, not by a few years or a few hundred years, but a few thousand years. We are, you know, if it was earlier, three uh, millennia before BC, now it's eight or even more, time immemorial. We are told that we were a nation in ancient India, we were a nation when the Buddha was around, we were a nation when the Guptas were there, all kinds of theories are there. But I want to emphasize this is not true. What is true is that we can talk about the emergence of pan-Indian empires in the past. The Maurya king Ashoka was the earliest ruler who in India had close to a subcontinental empire. So if we are talking about some elements of political unification, we can go back and look at the Mauryan empire. But it would be very wrong if we said that India was a nation under Ashoka. <coughs> Because being a nation is something very different from being part of an empire in the ancient world. Because empire and nation are two very different phenomena. It is not just a question of political unity, which is imposed from above by a ruler or ruling class or a ruling clan. Similarly, during the Gupta period, we again had rulers who conquered and unified large parts of the territory of the subcontinent. We can say that with the Mughals that happened again. The Mughal Empire did cover large parts of the subcontinent and yet we will not say that India was a nation under the Mughals. Nobody says that by the way. 
the nation only in the ancient past. Huh? Somewhere in the middle, the nation disappears and then resurfaces again. But the main point I want to make here is that in the process of the evolution of modern nations, when people hark back to history, they are harking back in order to look for certain symbols, certain cultural features, certain unifying features, but it is not tantamount to saying that we were a nation in the ancient past. In fact, I'm repeating a little. This is very important because particularly for us in India today, we are often told this, how the Rashtra, you know, is a very old one, and the nation we are even told, as if the soul of the nation or its spirit has been suffering for so many years, and now that spirit has to some of some sort of come into its own, like Hegelian notion of spirit. But the nation was always there. Whether it was evident or not, it was always there. This, I repeat, <laughs> is not true. You may have some cultural commonness which emerges over the centuries. Even that cannot be the same as, you know, what it could be in, let's say, the year 2500. There could be cultural commonalities 2500 years ago, but those cultural commonalities could be very different from what the cultural commonalities are today. Because given the level of communications, contacts, technology, obviously the situation would be very different. In Europe, the political process of the emergence of nations started in an embryonic way in the middle of the 17th century with the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648, which recognized national sovereignties. As these nations emerged, they started looking back at their histories to see if they could find some common features which could help them ground their new nationalism in the present. Sometimes they found them and sometimes they did not. And different countries, and this is important, found different things. In Germany, for example, the notion of being a German nation was very much based on a form of romantic nationalism tied up with what they called folk culture. The notion was that the Germans were a people whose speciality was that they had a very strong folk culture and that they saw this as their distinctive national identity. Fascinating, I find, this phenomenon because folk cultures are always localized. And yet, that got adopted as a kind of hallmark of German nationalism, which is actually on a much bigger scale. Nationalism is never local. But these are the strange ways in which history uh, moves. In some other countries, religion could be a unifying factor, which went along with the modern idea of nationalism. In France, for example, there was, of course, the French Revolution, with the notion that we believe in similar ideas, which was the foundation of French nationalism. But along with it somewhere, Catholicism was a solidifying factor. In Germany, Protestantism remained a solidifying factor. In Britain, we know how Britain under the Tudor King Henry VIII broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, adopted Protestantism, and that became a symbol of national sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the Roman Catholic Church. So Protestantism of a different kind, different from the German kind, became a hallmark of British national identity. But Britain was also the United Kingdom, which united the Scots, the Welsh, and the English. And British nationalism is thus constituted by three very distinct identities. Britain also retained the institution of the monarchy, albeit in a modified form, as a constitutional monarchy. And the monarchy, in fact, has become, paradoxically, a symbol of modern British nationalism, as did the monarchy in Japan. So we have the fascinating phenomenon of two neighboring nations with completely contrasting symbols of nationalism, the Republic in France and the monarchy in Britain. And both have served their purpose equally well 
or equally badly, depending on where you are situated. Republican France exhibited no more inhibitions as a colonial power than did monarchical Britain. The slogans of the revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, proved no greater hindrance to the French acquiring and exploiting colonial territories across the world than did the Magna Carta to the British. So each country has its own specific history of how it emerges as a modern nation and how it then deals with other identities which are part of its history and part of its formation as a nation. The famous historian Hobsbawm, who I think is one of the best historians of the modern age, has emphasized this in his work where he says, each nation evolves differently. Nations are similar in that they are nations. They are similar in that they have a feeling of nationalism, but there the similarity ends. What that nationalism is, the content of that nationalism, that is the content of being Indian, the content of being American, the content of being French is very different. And it is different because your histories go into the evolution of that identity. You do not become a nation overnight. It is not that one day you wake up and say, I am an Indian. It is a process. Sometimes it happens through a revolutionary process, like the French Revolution or the American Revolution. In our case, it happened primarily through our national revolution, that is the anti-colonial movement for independence, the freedom struggle. It's through that that we became a nation. It was primarily through that that we began to think of ourselves as Indians because that movement brought us all together to fight a common enemy. And in the process of fighting that common enemy, we started to discover more and more commonalities also about each other which went then beyond just the purpose of fighting together for freedom. We also then found common cultural attributes and we discovered that we were in fact becoming Indians. The, the phrase that was used by the leaders of the freedom struggle and which uh, Bipin students know he was most fond of was India was a nation in the making, always emphasizing the process rather than the fact. In Europe, when nationalism emerged, it first emerged as a new political state formation to take the place of the earlier empires. This process took about two centuries. It was initially very slow. It picked up in the 18th century and then speeded up in the 19th. 1857 was a very important moment because with the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, one consequence was that the old empires crumbled and uh, a lot of new nations came into being. Again, the whole of the 19th century saw the process of the formation of nations. Italy, for example, and Germany. Again, it is important to remember that if even within Europe, which is a fairly unified area, nation formation does not take place at the same time. <coughs> there is one particular aspect that I wish to emphasize about the emergence of nations and nationalism in Europe, which is that almost right from the beginning, European nationalism gets tied up with colonial agendas. And this has a very important bearing on the nature and character of European nationalism. Oliver Cromwell, having defeated Charles I, conquered Ireland in the name of the British Parliament almost immediately after the Treaty of Westphalia of 1648. In fact, it was just a year later. And he let loose unspeakable atrocities on the Irish, which led to a drastic reduction of the population by some estimates as much as 40%. Lands of Catholics were seized, Thousands made indentured laborers and sent to the West Indies. No Catholic worship was allowed. Hundreds of thousands died of plague. So as early as the 17th century, 
because the Treaty of Westphalia recognizes the different sovereignties of different Europe in Europe, so even then, along with the early imaginings of nationalism, comes imperial conquest and colonial conquest. This speeds up in the 18th century. India, for example, is conquered from the middle of the 18th century onwards. But even before that, the competition between the Dutch and the French and the English and the Portuguese for colonial possessions had started. So the nationalism that emerges in Europe has, from the very beginning, also an aggressive and aggrandizing aspect to it. I think this is very important for us to remember because it gives a particular quality to that nationalism. It also had a liberationist aspect in the beginning because it was against the empires. It was for the liberation of the smaller units. So in the beginning, it had both these characteristics. But from the middle of the 19th century, you find the aggressive part begins to get stronger. <coughs> Why? As more and more of the world had already been conquered and made into colonies, the ones outside Europe, by the European countries, those countries like Italy and Germany, who were latecomers in the business of national unification and industrial development, as they became powerful, they wanted a share of the national spoil, of the colonial spoils. They also wanted captive markets for their products. This is from about the period of the 1870s and 1880s then. This new phase begins. And this is the period of the scramble for Africa and the partition of Africa, which happens by the end of the 19th century. You know how they did sit down on a table and actually draw lines, straight lines, which went through valleys and mountains and through lakes and through paths which the tribes had taken for centuries and divided Africa up among the European powers. This, which also coincides with a new stage of imperialism, which we call the age of finance capital or the age of finance imperialism, is a very reactionary period of imperialism, far more reactionary than the early, earlier periods. So European nationalism in the early years, as I said, for the first century and a half, had both these aspects, liberationist as well as reactionary. But I want to emphasize, in the colonies, as far as the colonies were concerned, it was the aggrandizing aspect and the aggressive aspect which was expressed and not the liberationist aspect, even in the early phase. That was for their own countries. However, from the late 19th century onwards, it becomes more and more reactionary, nationalism that is, and in the 20th century, we get it in its worst form. In Europe, nationalism takes the most reactionary form of fascism and Nazism, but that is also nationalism, let us not forget. So it was like a gradual progression. It is this extreme reactionary form which it takes vis-a-vis -vis the colonies, which then feeds back into the whole. It is precisely Italy and Germany, those who had felt that they had got left out of the race, where these phenomena emerge in a big way, that is fascism and Nazism. Let us not forget that both Mussolini and Hitler justified their policies and their politics and their ideologies in the name of nationalism. So nationalism can take on, has taken on in world history, a very reactionary aspect, which is why in the Western world, for example, after the Second World War, when people have been through the horrors of Nazism and fascism and the Second World War, in which millions and millions of people lost their lives, the word or the phenomenon of nationalism actually acquired a derogatory meaning a negative connotation. Even today, when as scholars we talk about, often in conferences, about our nationalism, our freedom struggle, and we talk about it in a positive way, scholars from Europe particularly are very suspicious because the progressive ones among them have started to look upon nationalism in a very negative way, given the experiences of their own countries. 
In the colonial countries, nationalism emerges as part and parcel of the movement for liberation from colonial rule. In the Indian case, on which I shall focus now, the emergence of the modern ideas of nationalism can be dated back to the 1870s and the 1880s. We do not really think that the modern idea of nationalism had yet emerged in the National Revolt of 1857, even though it was a huge revolt against the colonial power. But from the 1870s, first and foremost in the Indian language press, what was then called the vernacular press, the first ideas of nationalism begin to emerge. People started writing and talking about the negative consequences of British rule, the necessity to change it, what kind of modern nation should we bring into being. These nebulous ideas first in a rudimentary form and then gradually they went on developing, did begin in the 1870s. Dadabhai Naroji's work also starts coming out around the same time when he starts analyzing the economic effects of British rule on India and comes out with the theory of the drain of wealth where he shows that the Indian economy had been subjugated to that of Great Britain and how there is a continuous drain of wealth that occurs from India to Britain. He is joined very soon by a galaxy of other leaders Ranade, Gokhale, Agarkar, R.C. Dutt, Subramanya Ayer and others who then flesh out this whole theory of economic nationalism on which then the new ideas of political nationalism begin to be based. Economic nationalism, I want to emphasize, gave a solid grounding to Indian nationalism and protected it from straying into nativist or ethnic or culturalist directions. From the 1870s and 1880s, we also have modern political organizations cropping up, first at the local level and then at the at provincial level and then at the national level. And then in 1885, the Indian National Congress emerges out of the whole process where there was a national conference and other similar organizations. Thus, by 1885, we have a unified national organization which calls itself the Indian National Congress, each word of its name signifying something very important. The words Indian and national denote that there is an Indian nation which it represents. And the term Congress, which is taken from the American Congress, means it is a parliament of the people. It also signifies that it is committed to a democratic form or bringing in a democratic form of government. I want to emphasize that the role of the first 30 to 40 years of intellectual endeavor by some of the best minds of India was very crucial in fleshing out the notion of what this Indian nation was going to be, what it should be. What is the basis on which it should be built? It was not just one Dadabhai Naroji or one Gokhale or one Tilak. There was a galaxy of people of extraordinary ability who devoted their life to this process. And it bears emphasis that the foundation of Indian nationalism was not just in the movement out in the streets or in the public halls. It was very much an intellectual process in which the best minds of different parts of the country participated. The first and foremost thing that comes out of this process is that they all agree that what they need to build is an Indian nation. This is not self-evident, by the way. Don't forget that the British had said that India is just a geographical expression. It consists of two big communities. No question of India being a nation. That's what they were fighting against. But they agree that what they need to build is an Indian nation and not a Bengali nation or a Tamil nation or a Maratha nation. If this is so, then obviously the next, uh, the next step is that language cannot be the unifying factor for nationalism. Again, this was no small conclusion to come to. In European nationalism, language had been a very important unifying uh, and differentiating uh, factor. But the Indian leadership rejected that. 
no matter how much Lokmanya Tilak may love Marathi, which he did, no matter how great his command over it, he brought out two newspapers, Kesari in Marathi and the Maratha in English. Similarly, almost all the famous leaders of the time, many of whom were very fine journalists, were very good in their own languages and communicated with their regional audience in their own language. But simultaneously, they had the belief that they were building an Indian nation and the movement which was going to fight for was for independence, not of their province, not the independence of Bengal from colonial rule, not the independence of Mysore or Hyderabad from colonial rule, but for the independence of India. And this was a big step forward. So obviously what was worked out then was that the Indian nation could not be based on a single linguistic identity. That could not be the solidifying factor. Could it be based on a single religion? In a multi-religious country, clearly not. We saw how in Europe, along with language, along with other features, religion had provided a solidifying fact, uh, feature. In a multi-religious country, clearly not. If it was based on one religion, then it could not be Indian nationalism. It would have to be Hindu nationalism, Sikh nationalism, Muslim nationalism. It could not be Indian nationalism. And if you were going to build an Indian nation and you were agreed on that, then religion could not be the basis for that nationalism. It was ruled out. Sri Aurobindo, who is sometimes claimed as an ancestor of the Hindutva forces, though nothing could be further from the truth, says very clearly, every part of this country, from the most advanced to the most backward, from the Aboriginal tribes to the highly cultivated and the educated, they are all part of this nation. Nobody is outside the scope of what is India. They will come into it in different ways and at different paces. He mentions different religions, he mentions different people, he mentions tribals, he mentions different languages. He said these are all part of the Indian nation, though they, will, they are all at different stages of development and will come into the process of nation building in their own ways. Bipin Chandrapal, the extremist leader from Bengal, came up with the concept of composite nationalism. And that was his unique contribution to the intellectual uh, fashioning of Indian nationalism. What does composite mean? Composite means it is not exclusionary nationalism. It's a nationalism which combines in it the Hindu, the Muslim, the Sikh, the Christian. It's composite. It is not a Hindu nationalism, it is not a Muslim nationalism or a Sikh nationalism or a single religion based or community based or region based nationalism. When you think of nationalism, you think of a single identity. But the moment you put in the word composite, it becomes something else. It's composed of different elements. It is no longer a singular identity. Composite nationalism by its very nature was also secular. It did not privilege any one religion or religious community. It's testified by their refusal to yield to the demands for a Hindu Rashtra and adoption and by their adoption of a secular constitution. Gandhiji's epic struggle against communal forces from 1946 to his martyrdom in the cause in January 1948 strengthened the secular fabric of the nation. Obviously, I can't elaborate on any of these points uh, at length, but for shortage of time. The nationalist leadership also understood that while Indian nationalism could, be, could not be based on religious, regional, or linguistic, or ethnic identities, at the same time, it was very important that none of these identities should feel that they were being suppressed by or submerged into the Indian nation. This meant that the way in which Indian nationalism was defined and practiced must be such that the Hindus feel that they have full space for their interests, including religious interests, to flower. So should the Muslims, so should the Bengalis feel that their language and culture would prosper as much 
as they wanted to. So should the Tamils, so should the Malayalis. And so should the tribals feel that there is an equal pace for them and they will not be hustled into changing at a pace that doesn't suit them. So the conception of nationalism had to be multifaceted, it had to be inclusive, and at the same time be what we today call non-homogenizing. It is very common nowadays in academic circles to use the word homogenizing nationalism. <laughs> they go almost together. It is assumed that as in Europe, nationalism will inevitably homogenize. It will suppress all differences. But Indian nationalism from the beginning is imagined and built around, built as a non-hegemonizing ideology because it could not do otherwise. So it was a very intro interesting process through which different regions were guaranteed their linguistic, cultural, religious, and other identities, and that their interests were not just protected, but could flower and grow. This is how the idea of linguistic provinces came into being. India was divided under the British, as I'm sure you all know, into presidencies and provinces, which each of which included many linguistic units within them. For example, the Madras Presidency included Malayalam-speaking, parts of Malayalam-speaking Kerala, parts of Telugu-speaking Andhra, and also the Tamil-speaking areas. Bengal Presidency included Assam, Orissa, Bihar, and so on. So in 1920, when Gandhiji became the leader of the national movement, and he wrote a new constitution for the Congress, the first thing that he did was to reorganize the Congress along linguistic lines. The Congress could not reorganize the country, they didn't have the power. But what they could do is reorganize themselves. So earlier there used to be a Bombay Presidency Provincial Congress Committee as the local regional unit. There used to be a Madras Presidency Congress Committee. Now it became Maharashtra Provincial Congress Committee Gujarat Provincial Congress Committee, that is the Bombay Presidency now had so many Provincial Congress Committees, the Sindh Provincial Congress Committee, and for Bombay City, given its unique character, because it was a mix of Marathi speaking and Gujarati speaking, there was a separate Bombay Provincial Congress Committee to take care of that. So four distinct Provincial Congress Committees, and the same story is repeated in each pro presidency and each province. There was a Tamil Nadu Congress Committee, which was not there earlier. There was a Karnataka uh, Provincial Congress Committee, a Kerala PCC, and so on. So all the linguistic regions which were not recognized by the British were recognized by the Congress. This was done in order to give the people of every region the assurance that their language and their love for their language and culture was recognized and would have full space in an independent India. There were some other attributes of Indian nationalism as well, some of which became clear in the beginning and some of which developed over the years. In the very early stages of the movement, we find, for example, that Dadabhai Naraji, who first articulated the theory of economic nationalism, made it very clear that what Indian nationalism had to address itself to was the poverty of the Indian peasant. So he connected nationalism not to some abstract notion of the wealth of India, but concretely to the poverty of the peasantry of India. His book analyzed that he showed how the drain of wealth is based on the taxation of the Indian peasantry and on the indebtedness of the peasantry and how that goes into the British coffers and how that then becomes the drain of wealth. Other national leaders also constantly talked about the poverty of the peasant. R.C. Majumdar, for example, focused on the oppressive land revenue system, and his open letter, letter to Lord Curzon actually led to a change in land revenue policy. Ranade investigated the indebtedness of the Maharashtra peasantry, 
which had led to the Deccan riots of 1865, and he helped draft the Deccan Agriculturist Relief Act, the first ever ameliorative legislation passed by the British for the peasants. What does all this do? This gives to the whole idea of Indian nationalism a concreteness, a pro-peopleness, a pro-poorness, for want of better words, that nationalism has to mean concrete things to real people. It is not just that it is good for this nation, with a big N. What is this nation? This nation is the people. And who are these people? Primarily in India, it is the poor people. If nationalism has not done anything for the poor people, then what use is this nationalism? So this connection, which was made very early on, which you see continuing through Gandhi, the notion of the Ridra Narayan, for example, the notion of basing his movement on the poorest, and that nobody should be outside the ambit of politics. What is the nation? The nation is the people of India. Nation is not a land. Nation is not an abstract entity of rivers, mountains, territory. A nation is its people. I'll give you an example. You read Jawala Nehru's Discovery of India, or even better, if you can recall Sham Benegal's Bharate Khoj, and the episode, first episode in it, I think, which is based on Nehru's Discovery of India, where Jawala Nehru goes into a village and he's speaking to rural folk. They are sitting there under a tree and he goes there and he say, and they all say Bharat Mata ki jai. He asks them, Bharat Mata kya hai? What is Mother India? Somebody says, ye hamari zameen hai, ye Bharat Mata hai. Ye hamari mitti hai, ye Bharat Mata hai. And he then replies to them and he says, no. Bharat Mata Tum. It is you, the people, who are Mother India. Mother India is not this land, it is not this country, it is you, the people of India, who are Mother India. Thus, this notion that the nation is its people, the notion that when you are working for the nation, you are working for the welfare of the people, and not for some abstract glory of the nation, for some abstract recognition of being the first in the world, and sitting at the high table, while 30% of your population or thereabouts lives below the poverty line. In his famous speech, commonly known as the Trist with Destiny speech, on the midnight of 4th and 15th of August 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru said this in this way. He said, the service of India means the service of the millions who suffer. It means the ending of poverty and disease and inequality of opportunity. He did not say service to the nation means that we must become the greatest and most powerful military nation in the world. The Indian national leaders had to address the question, why do we need to throw out the British? And their answer was, we need to throw out the British not because they are white in race, we have nothing against the white races. Gandhiji said it again and again. We have nothing against the British. We are against imperialism. We, are, we have nothing against any Britisher. We are against the imperial system. It is the system that I want to break. I don't want to throw a single stone on a Britisher. That's why nonviolence was necessary. And I don't want to hurt a single Britisher. They are all cogs in a machine. Therefore, to teach the Indian people that what is oppressing you is the system and not any one individual. It is not the Christians who are oppressing you, therefore don't become anti-Christian. It is not the white people, as I said, who are oppressing you, don't become anti-white. It is not the soldier or the policeman whom you see as your enemy who is oppressing you. He is also a victim of this system called imperialism. So this notion that was that what we were fighting was a system and we were fighting it because it oppressed our people, it suppressed our culture in the concrete sense of the term and not in some abstract sense of the term was a very important contribution which has gone into the making of what it is to be an Indian and what it is to be an Indian nation. We 
Gandhiji, another very important feature came into the picture, apart, of course, from the notion of non-violence, the implications of which we are yet to fully explore. But today is not the occasion for that. How much uh, it did for us and for the world, non-violence, I mean, needs to be talked about and discussed. But what I'm talking about here is that, I'm making the statement, that Gandhiji's persona, his whole approach to politics, kept Indian nationalism free of any notion of aggression. He made it very humane. He made it very empathetic to the poor, empathetic to the disadvantaged. You cannot associate any, any notion of aggression, of aggressiveness in his nationalism. Nehru understood this in this way. Again, in the same speech which I referred to, The Twist with Destiny, Nehru says, referring to Gandhi, he says, the ambition of the greatest man of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye. That is what Gandhiji's idea of independence and nationalism was. To wipe every tear from every eye. It is very simple and yet so profound that independence means there should be no tears in the eyes of the people of this country. The very fact that he did not talk about the glory of the nation but of the welfare of each and every person of the poorest is very significant. His talisman that whenever you are thinking or whenever you have a doubt about what next step you should take, what policy option you should adopt, bring before you the face of the poorest person you have ever seen and ask yourself what effect my step will have on him and the answer will come to you immediately. You will not remain in a dilemma. You will know what you have to do. If that step is going to help the poor person, then it is the right step. So he gave this humane, pro-people, pro-poor, empathetic quality to our nationalism. However, this nationalism which was bequeathed to us by our freedom struggle, which we have absorbed through our own life experience, understood through our studies, learned from our families, through our parents, is now under challenge. We are presented with a nationalism that doesn't look to us like our own nationalism at all. In the most recent horrific example, the national flag, the Tiranga, the dearly loved Tiranga, for which hundreds of people gave up their lives during the freedom struggle, was held aloft by people organized by a body called the Hindu Manch, which was protecting Hindu rapists of a Muslim child in Katwa. In UP, not far from Delhi, the national flag was used to wrap the body of a man accused of murdering a Muslim man on suspicion that he had stored beef in his fridge. In other parts of the country, innumerable incidents of attacks on individuals on various pretexts, sometimes love jihad, sometimes preventing cow slaughter, what have you, have become extremely common. Of late, some attempts, some successful, to instigate communal riots, to instigate large-scale communal violence, have also been made, as we know, in the last few weeks. The Muslim minority in the country particularly has been pushed into a situation where they are voiceless and full of despair. Those who call themselves nationalists today have none of the attributes given to Indian nationalism by the freedom struggle. In fact, the ideology they espouse was clearly described by the freedom fighters as communalism. And I want to emphasize this which is the antithesis of nationalism. From Bhagat Singh to Gandhi, there was unanimity that communalism was the biggest hurdle to national unity. And it is this communalism. Let us not be fooled by any other uh, theory. It is this communalism which is today masquerading as nationalism. Another nefarious trend is the targeting and silencing of powerful dissenting voices, as witnessed in the murders of Pansare, Dabulkar, Kalburgi, and Gauri Lankesh, 
allegedly by those owing allegiance to communal organizations, but who call themselves nationalist. When writers returned their awards in protest, it was called manufactured dissent. The media is sought to be controlled by a combination of pressure, threats, <clears throat> bug up, and allurement. All criticism and dissent is instantly labeled as anti-national. At times like this, we feel that somebody else's distorted idea of nationalism is being pushed down our throats, and we are told that to be a good nationalist, you have to be like this. In my university, there was an agitation two years ago, which you all know about. Our students were called anti-national. Lots of us were also called anti-national. Some senior army, retired army people even came to our university and advised our vice chancellor that to inculcate the feeling of nationalism in JNU teachers and students, they should place an army tank <laughs> which had been used in the war against Pakistan in front of the administrative block to remind the teachers and students of this, of this university of Indian nationalism. If my nationalism is going to be expressed through an army tank, which has seen battle against people who were, till a few decades ago, ago my own flesh and blood, my families, refugees from Pakistan. How do I react to that? This is what, this is how we are going to think of ourselves as good nationalists. That we now have to shout like General Bakshi on Times Now to be a good nationalist. Is this what we have to do? I'm sorry, but if this is the definition of being a good nationalist, I'm sure most Indians are going to find themselves very uncomfortable. If I do not like a particular policy, why cannot I, for good economic reasons, say that I have problems with demonetization without being called anti-national? Why cannot a nationalist Indian have a right to raise questions on Kashmir, as our students did, or even shout slogans? Why can't you do these things? These are issues of civil liberties. These are issues of freedom of expression. If I criticize you and you come back to me not with a counter argument, but you say that the very fact that you are raising this issue proves that you are anti-national and you must be dealt with under the sedition law, as actually happened with innocent JNU students. The president of the Students' Union, who had never shouted any slogan, and everybody knew that, including the police, as well as some other students, were charged with sedition. And I hope all of you know that more than two years have passed, in fact, two years and three months have passed, and there is still no charge sheet against these students. Leave alone cases, cases of course have not been dropped. They are on bail. So the Damocles sword still hangs on their head. Their careers obviously have big uh, question marks. Why is it that in today's independent India, with the story and history that I have told you of our nationalism, should students be charged with sedition for something that happened in broad daylight? Not a stone was thrown, not a hair on anybody's head was hurt. Some slogans, God knows who shouted them, and even if they shouted them, it doesn't mean anything. Under what kind of notion of nationalism are we now operating? Recently, our nationalist vice-chancellor, his nationalism cannot be questioned since he owes allegiance to the RSS, which everybody knows got us our freedom from the British, <laughs> has invented new techniques of testing the nationalist credentials of faculty and students. I'm not focusing on JNU because I come from there, but I think it's a very good example of what's going on everywhere. In national interest, of course, by flouting all the rules, he imposed compulsory attendance on students 
and he asked teachers to implement it. Some obviously anti-national elements <laughs> had the temerity to ask for a discussion of the issue. They didn't even reject it. They said, can we talk about it, please? And they were instantly shown their anti-national place by being dismissed from office. In the meantime, a Pakka nationalist, out on bail on charges of sexual harassment of eight students, continues to hold responsible positions. This has indeed become a very strange nationalism. In its name, in Katua, in Unnao, in JNU, alleged sexual offenders are defended and victims stigmatized. In fact, in JNU now, as in apartheid era, we now have nationalist spaces and anti-national spaces. Sabarmati hostile grounds have been earmarked for the anti-nationals to hold their protest. <laughs> the admin block and area around and other nationalist, nationalist spaces are barred to the anti-national teachers and students. I want to emphasize here why I'm making this point, especially about freedom of expression and uh, the, the freedom to dissent and pointing out how nationalism is being used to crush dissent, is because in the history of our freedom struggle, there was a total commitment, not just to democracy, but to civil liberties. It was meant to be a civil libertarian democracy. I don't have the time to go into details, I have written about it uh, elsewhere, that civil, the, the struggle for civil liberties was a very crucial part of the struggle for freedom. And all the national uh, leaders, in fact, were completely, were committed to it from Ram Mohan Roy to Srinandan Banerjee to Tilak to Gandhi to Nehru. But for lack of time, I will just like to share with you a few uh, quotations from Gandhiji in order to make the point that how what is happening today is a travesty of our nationalism. Gandhiji himself said there were no limits to freedom of expression. And he said it not in independent India. He said it under the British. I will read out a quotation which will possibly shock you. This is at the height of the non-cooperation movement in 1921. He says, I quote, liberty of speech means it is unassailed, even when the speech hurts. Liberty of press can be said to be truly respected only when the press can comment on the severest terms upon and even, mark this, misrepresent matters. That is liberty. <coughs> you can't suppress it by saying that it is misrepresented because it is your version of what is misrepresented. You can always use misrepresentation as an excuse to suppress. So he said, freedom of press means the liberty to misrepresent. Freedom, I'm quoting again, freedom of association is truly respected when assemblies of people can discuss even revolutionary projects. That is freedom of assembly. Freedom to discuss revolution, that is the overthrow of the state. The only line that he drew was that of non-violence, as is apparent from the next quotation. I quote, civil liberty consistent with the observance of non-violence is the first step towards Swaraj. He then says, civil liberty is the breadth of political and social life. It is the foundation of freedom. It is the water of life. That's the kind of imagery that he uses. Water which cannot be uh, diluted. Whiskey can be diluted, water can't. So he does not conceive of freedom without civil liberty. Independence for him has no value. If we cannot speak what we want to speak, if we cannot gather where we want to gather, whether it is on the steps outside the vice chancellor's office, which is now covered with iron railings and uh, flower pots, to prevent its own students and teachers from accessing that place, or anybody else, or from Jantar Mantar.
So the only limit that he puts on this is that of non-violence. And I want to tell you that this is akin, almost identical to what the Supreme Court said with regard to Section 124A, which is the section on sedition, as early as 1962, and that is the law to date. The, the Supreme Court has said that in order to charge somebody with sedition, you can't just say that they are planning an overthrow of the state or planning violence. You have to prove imminent violence. That is, that those words, those actions, will lead to those who are hearing immediately getting up and indulging in violence. Then only can you charge a person with sedition. But here, as we know, I just told you what is happening uh, in our universities. And what I want to emphasize is that it's not just a question of our students or of JNU. These are carefully orchestrated uh, events meant to send a message, a chilling message down the line to everybody in the country that those who transgress boundaries will not be spared. It is like in the olden days, in medieval times, you used to hang people in the middle of the village square or the town square from a tree or a pole or whatever. The idea was that all the onlookers should know that this is where you will be if you dare do anything akin to what that person has done. And in today's time, this is the message that is sent out by picking up a few people and then whether it is the killings of Gauri Lankesh and others, whether it is the charging with sedition, these are all meant as messages uh, for the rest, rest of us. Just as hangings were not public entertainment in the medieval age, these also are not uh, innocent. I do think, however, and I would wind up with this, that we cannot ignore this debate. We cannot leave the space of nationalism to those that are seeking to occupy it. Because nationalism is too powerful an idea. We must understand its resonance among the people. And we must therefore try to appropriate to ourselves the real Indian nationalism, what I would call the revolutionary Indian nationalism. We must argue that the Indian nationalism, genuine Indian nationalism, is a progressive nationalism. But there is also a regressive and a jingoistic nationalism, which is what the powers to be are imposing on us today. And we must tell the people that we stand, we are not anti-national, we do not reject nationalism, but we stand for the humane, compassionate, pro-people, revolutionary nationalism of our freedom struggle. That, that is the tradition which we have to hold on to, and that is the tradition which we have to assert and throw in the face of those who are challenging our nationalism. Thank you.